ora. Welcome to episode two of Child Poverty and Aotearoa Tackling Inequality 2014. This week we'll focus on health and the shocking plight of many of New Zealand's poor children who suffer from preventable diseases. These illnesses not only rob them of proper childhoods, but can also cause health problems in adulthood and shorten their lives. Poor health makes it difficult for them to learn, depriving them of education and condemning them to low-skilled jobs or unemployment. This week we'll also speak to Hone Fowler from Mangere East Community Learning Centre and Ronji Tanialu from the Salvation Army about their work on the ground in areas of deprivation. But first, Let's welcome Professor Innes Asher and Dr Rhys Jones to talk about child poverty and health. Kia ora Rhys, welcome to the programme. Kia ora Katrina. And kia ora Innes, welcome. Kia ora Katrina. What impacts do you see in your work as a result of child poverty? Well child poverty underpins everything about child well-being and health because income is, is crucial to everything that parents need to do to keep their children well. Um, so we, so from nutrition to being able to go to the doctor when you need to, to being able to um, afford a warm house, uh, everything that's needed to keep a child healthy and well requires some money. And quite frankly in New Zealand at the moment about one in five children at least are uh, missing out on enough money in their household to look after their basic well-being and health. So the consequences we see um, are quite far-reaching. The first thing that I see as a practicing paediatrician are children who are coming in with really preventable diseases. Um, there's common ones like pneumonia that hasn't had a lot of attention but that's very common in New Zealand and children being admitted to hospital with severe pneumonia in, in very high numbers and disproportionately coming from children who are living in poverty. Now pneumonia if, if not adequately treated or not treated early enough can result in permanent lung damage. Permanent lung damage is a good condition called bronchiectasis, not a well known term, but that means the scarring of the airways in the lungs and that means you can have um, permanent ill health and even uh, you can go on to being too sick to work and even die young. Uh, so it's really, it can have very permanent and far reaching effects from that one acute episode. And is that what you see also preventable diseases and also I think illnesses that we thought had been eradicated? Yes, I think um, the, the consequences of child poverty are really far reaching as Innes has said and uh, include not only those respiratory type infections but also um, rheumatic fever, um, skin infections, a wide range of different things that, uh, that really affect children's health and education you know and we know that um, education is a key starting point and sets you off on a trajectory for either succeeding or, or not in life and um, a lot of children are missing out on that because of because of child poverty and the health outcomes of that. Um, and what do you see specifically the impacts for Māori children? Um, I mean I think the impacts for Māori children are everything that we see for, for all children with poverty but uh, the impacts just that much worse and that much more common for Māori um, and for Pacific communities as well. You know, we know that child poverty is not evenly distributed across our society. Um, so we know that Māori and Pacific children are far more likely to be living in, child, uh, in poverty and that, uh, you know, the impacts are, are just worse. All those major conditions that we, that we see um, are much more common among Māori and Pacific children. Mm. And what specific steps need to be taken to improve children's health in Aotearoa? We need to pay attention to uh, uh, three key, key areas, poverty, unhealthy housing and inadequate basic health care, which tr tragically are affecting a lot of our children, those three things at once, and that can cause disease and very poor outcomes. So. Um, we really, the very first thing is we need to take poverty much more seriously. Uh, we're very disappointed that there's no uh, cross-party on child poverty measurement and strategies to alleviate it. Uh, so poverty is entrenched and it's quite deep for a lot of children uh, and we, there really has been no serious steps taken by government to change the situation. And so we've got people 
children are stuck in a very, uh, very, very adverse situation. So taking poverty seriously, actually doing something about it, and then the what, related and things. What specific steps? What specific steps do you think are needed? Well, we need to look at the incomes of, of families, and there's, for the, those in work, we need to look at the uh, minimum wage, which is inadequate, and we also need to look at the uh, income support benefits for people who are, uh, who are uh, supported by income support benefits. We do it quite well. Uh, we adjust for it well in the elderly, who receive a benefit, i.e., superannuation, but for young families, we don't have that same adjustment for CPI and keeping up with, keeping up with inflation and, and the cost of living. So uh, income support benefits were slashed severely in 1991 by 21% and they've never been, never been restored relatively. So we've, that's caused a real surge in numbers of kids in poverty and we could change that if we wanted to. Yeah, we really could. And how important do you think it is to start with wraparound care for children beginning before birth and then following them through? I, I think that is really important. I, th I think what Ines has been talking about in terms of those broader social and economic policies are really the key thing. Um, but we also need to, to make sure that health services are you know, playing their part and being really effective, um, bearing in mind that you know that there are a number of children that um, or a huge number of children who are currently experiencing poverty and who need um, health services to be able to mitigate the effects of that um, and so one of the things that I don't think we do very well is to to make sure that we provide continuity of care and that that care is really effective uh, for children and parents looking after children um, other countries do that much better, mm. better than us I think but we have a lot of children who fall through the cracks and that's particularly the case for children in families where there's domestic violence and poverty because they're so transient, they're just moving all the time. Yeah, well, poverty is associated with a lot, a lot of uh, other problems, and um, that all impacts on the way you know, parents' ability to look after children and therefore you know, those children's health. And so I think it's about doing something about those underlying issues, that the poverty that, that's driving um, those other problems. And I think that it, it is, as in, in a said, a question of priorities, really. Um, you know, if we value children and if we want to do something about these shameful child poverty statistics, uh, then we can do that. We have the ability to. Should Aotearoa have free primary health care for all children under 18? I believe so. Uh, we've, been we've been able to achieve that largely for the under sixes because it's been seen to be a good thing and there's been lobby lobbying around that, and I could say from Child Poverty Action Group, we've been successful there, and the Minister of Health has taken that on board. Uh, but the, just because you turn six doesn't mean you don't need free child, uh, healthcare. So children from six to 17 years, uh, technically children still, uh, really do need access to the, the doctor whenever they need to, not, uh, not influenced by cost. And the cost is still really quite high for that age group. Of course, it's high for adults as well. We acknowledge that, but we think the children need, you know, they're our future. Let's prioritise them and get it free for everybody, as they do in the United Kingdom, mm. um, where they don't have these terrible diseases. And mm. do we need a funding increase for children's health to produce equal outcomes for Māori and Pacifica children? Um, I think we do, uh, but I also think that throwing more money at it is not the only answer. Um, it's about how we do that. And um, one, one of the key principles here, I think, is actually what do we need to do to achieve equity of outcomes? Okay, so it's not that uh, we should be providing equal amounts of care and support for everyone, um, because we know that there's not a, a level playing field to start with, and that Māori and Pacifica children in particular um, are bearing the brunt of a lot of child poverty. Um, so we need to make sure that that funding is targeted to where it's needed most and where it can uh, provide the greatest benefit and um, I believe at the moment that is for uh, Māori and Pacifica children um, but also other, other children living in severe deprivation. Do we need a national child nutrition strategy including food in schools? Well I think we do. We've had a Ministry of Health national guidelines on what children should be fed for a long time and they're very good but we actually don't have any um, grunt behind that to actually make it happen and to be able to afford nutritious food requires a whole range of things, one of which is money, 
and uh, we do need to, we've got evidence from a number of diseases that our ch children's nutrition is actually relatively poor. We can have underweight babies getting pneumonia and then in older children, people who may be overweight. Uh, so we really need to uh, have a strategy to get better nutrition in children. Nutrition is quite key to fighting off diseases and to having better adult health as well. So uh, we think that's something that should be a priority and we know that there's been a lot of publicity about children going to school hungry, too hungry to learn. Uh, that's true. And as a country, that is something we, I think, now recognise. Solutions are what are debated, and it's, we need, need to have a national strategy, including food in schools for those who go to school hungry, to prevent that. Thanks very much, mm. Anas. Thank you, Reese. Now it's time for the child poverty win of the week. The government announced in last week's budget that $30 million a year had been set aside for free doctor's visits and prescriptions for all children under 13. The new policy will start in July 2015, extending the current free visits for children under 6. The initiative is expected to result in speedier treatment of skin infections, which are the commonest medical reason for hospitalisations of school-aged children. This budget policy is a good start, although it's a pity children have to wait more than a year for it to be implemented. Also, let's not stop at under-13s. Let's see the policy rapidly extended to provide free health care to all under-18-year-olds. Now, let's speak to Honi Fowler and Ronji Tanialu. Kia ora Ronji, welcome to the program. Uh, kia ora and Talofa, thanks for having me. And kia ora Honi, welcome. Tēnā koe, Katrina. What sort of poverty and deprivation do you see in Māngari? Um, well, as, as is widely known, Māngari is one of the most uh, deprived and um, disempowered communities in Aotearoa. Um, and uh, on a daily basis come into contact with people that are finding it increasingly harder uh, to make ends meet uh, day to day. Um, yeah, and, and that's just made worse by uh, an unhealthy options in our, in our community um, and, um, yeah, and a lack of uh, community resources as well. Mm. And how do low wages and low benefit levels impact on children's well-being? Um, well, it makes things uh, very difficult for parents and families um, that are living on um, low wages or, or benefits to survive and, and again to make ends meet, um, constantly having to uh, decide what they're going to spend their, their little resources on um, and, and this can affect um, children's health and, and families' um, health as well. And high housing costs are quite a big factor there, aren't they? Because people feel that they've got to pay the rent and so they might have less to spend on food. Absolutely. Um, the, you know, the housing cost is a huge portion of, of people's um, income and, um, and it's you know, widely known again that the housing prices and costs in Auckland are, are unsustainably high um, and um, the, you know, the, the amount of people that own homes um, in, in Mangere is, uh, is very low. Um, I, I'd put a guess to it would be less than 1% of people among them that own their own homes. So they're forced to rent um, and, these, and these rents are um, at the mercy of the landlords and often, all too often, um, tenants are, are taken for a ride, if you like, or are exploited by landlords that can charge these high rent prices. And again, this has, has effect on families and, and the health of the children in those families. And particularly perhaps one aspect is overcrowding and that has an impact on children's health because one family can't pay such a high rent, so there's more than one family living in one home? Absolutely, and that's, that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, overcrowding is a huge, uh, a huge issue in South Auckland, and Māngere in particular, and um, that you know, just makes illness and sickness within the home that much more um, of, a, of an issue. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add that um, about two years ago we did a Mangere housing survey over one census area unit uh, which is, was, was in Mangere East 
and uh, we found out that overcrowding was there, but it wasn't as much, as well reported as we expected it to be. And I think that uh, you know it's really hard because we did about 400 households in that census area block, and you'd open up the garage and people were overcrowded, but they were reporting that it was four people in the house. Yeah. Eh? So. It's an issue, but it, the data around it is really tough to, to gather, yeah. but it's definitely an issue. Yeah. And you're also the co-author of last year's first State of the Nation report on Pacifica people. What did that show? I think uh, a couple of things. Uh, one of the things it definitely showed was the fact that we need to keep learning from our history as Pacific people in New Zealand. And there's some wonderful lessons to learn, some wonderful things to celebrate, but also some things that really need... Um, a further work. It also showed that Pacific people in New Zealand are making some really good progress in specific areas like education, uh, but in other areas uh, like housing or unemployment, uh, the progress there has been painfully slow. Mm. And the report also found that 40% of Pacifica children live in poverty. What specific steps do you think need to be taken to end mm. that? I think a good starting point would be um, the, the Children's Commissioner's Expert Advisory Group. Um, they came up with some really specific ideas around Pacific young people, but, um, but also some general ideas that are applicable uh, to Pacific children. So I think that uh, those kinds of ideas and solutions uh, uh, need to be pursued uh, because we believe that that could help end that relative poverty. But as well as the structure and policy changes that we talk about as well, um, there should also be a challenge to Pacific leaders and communities themselves uh, to be informed about this, uh, these issues, to become agitated about the things that they're facing and to actually push uh, for effective actions that we think will help end these kinds of issues. Mm. And you mentioned earlier about learning from your history. What, what specific things do you mean there? I think one of the, the key points is um, what I, I was just saying to Hone um, outside. I, I saw a class of kids, uh, primary sc uh, school kids, walk past and 30, 40 years ago, all of those kids will be Māori or Pacific. I counted maybe four out of 60 kids were. And so I think part of the history of um, the, the shifting um, of Pacific people out of central Auckland into the suburbs and that gentrification, the polarisation that comes into, the, into play there, um, because those things are happening in our nation as we speak. We've got GI in East Auckland. We've got Paul Murray in Lower Hutt, uh, where, where communities that have been well established are just being ripped apart. And so there's lessons there that we need to uh, pick up from, from the past. And Horney talked about home ownership. Well, part of the reason that happened is Pacific people either weren't allowed or weren't informed enough to own their homes here. And so they moved to, to the greener pastures of, of other places. Mm. And another finding of your report was that uh, Pacifica children have lower rates of access to early childhood education. How do you think that can be improved? Yeah, I think that the data is actually showing that Pacific enrolment into um, ECE centres has actually been growing over the last five years, which is something to really celebrate. But the issue there is um, the actual gap between Pacific and, and other ethnicities. And so as Pacific enrolments have increased, um, uh, other ethnicity en uh, enrolment rates have increased as well and so the gap between Pacific and, and non-Pacific children is the key. So we were looking at injections of funding as we're looking at motivating Pacific parents to get their kids involved. Um, all of those things will contribute to some of those changes. Mm. And can you tell us about the work of the Mangere East Community Learning Centre? Yep, so we're based in Mangere East and uh, we offer um, a range of uh, free and very low cost um, public uh, um, community services that, in, um, that focus really on community well-being and development. Mm -hmm. um, and they include um, you know, ESOL classes for English of, uh, speakers of other languages and, um, and literacy and numeracy classes as well as, um, as, well as other uh, language classes including Te Reo Māori and um, Cook Island Māori and Nguyen. Um, we also have before and after school, after school care mm. and we also um, have a focus on health as well so we provide Tai Chi classes for free and, and um, other exercise classes as well. Mm. So yeah. What policies would you like to see from political parties at this year's election to improve the lives of children in poverty? Well one main thing for me is, is really to see um, uh, the disempowered communities have a lot more say in what policies, local policies and regional policies are, mm -hmm. just to touch on what Wanji was saying a, a bit earlier mm -hmm. around, around not having that voice in, in those um, decision making tables. Um, so I'd really like to challenge um, the decision makers, the policy makers, the, um, 
the councillors and MPs to include these communities uh, to, to have a real voice and, to, and for those communities to be able to express the realities of, um, of what, what poverty means and, and the effects of it. Uh, like Ron just said earlier, that the stats are one thing, but the realities might be something quite different. Mm. So um, giving these communities, often disempowered communities, that, that um, opportunity to, to have a say at, at the policy um, level and decision making time. And I'm assuming that you think that would be important as well. Yeah, totally agree with what Honey said. I think um, just to add two quick things from me in terms of what I'd like to see. I'd like to see what political parties um, do around unemployment. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at the Pacific rate is 13, around 13 percent, which is double the national rate. So, uh, uh, what will the parties do around unemployment? And the second thing is, uh, what will the parties do to provide safe, warm, and affordable housing that's accessible to all communities? And so. Uh, specifically for Pacific communities, I'd be really interested to see how they respond to providing um, a healthy uh, rental accommodation for families and if appropriate, and I really emphasise if appropriate, moving Pacific families into home ownership. So mm -hmm. I don't think every Pacific family should because there's other issues, but I think it's, it's around an unemployment and housing I'm really interested in. Thanks very much, Ronji. Thanks very much, Hone. Thank you, Jan. Now it's time for News of the Week. The New Zealand Deprivation Index released this month provides an in-depth analysis of 2013 census data. The index shows that the deprivation picture has remained unchanged for Māori for the entire 20 years since the index was first produced. Professor Peter Crampton of the University of Otago said that most Māori and Pacifica people still lived in socially deprived areas. He said he was taken aback by how stable ethnic patterns had remained. Stricter regulations for rental houses are being called for after a warrant of fitness trial failed more than 90% of the homes tested. The trial assessed 144 properties in Auckland, Tauranga, Wellington, Christchurch and Dunedin. 94% failed on at least one of the 31 assessment criteria on the checklist. Housing advocates and politicians say compulsory minimum standards for rental homes are needed to protect the health and safety of tenants. Food Bank Australia is concerned about how it will source extra food to meet an expected increase in demand arising from welfare cuts announced in last week's Australian budget. Food Bank New South Wales CEO Gerry Anderson said it was estimated that demand for services from his food bank would double in the next three years. Food banks in the United Kingdom have reported thousands more people turning to them for help there since welfare reforms were introduced in 2013. A report titled Why Children Die, Deaths in Infants, Children and Young People in the UK expresses deep concern about the links between poverty and child mortality. The report says that the overall United Kingdom child mortality rate is higher than in some other European countries. The document notes that there are marked social inequalities in death rates and that many of the causes and determinants of childhood deaths are preventable. The paper says that the key areas in which United Kingdom rates are relatively high are infant deaths and deaths among children and young people who have chronic conditions. It's estimated that 21% of child deaths involve modifiable factors, i.e. something could have been done to prevent the deaths. A nationwide schools competition launched in Christchurch earlier this month aims to give students a chance to learn about child poverty and be part of making a difference. The big picture competition calls on classes or youth groups to create a big picture showing what children in their neighbourhood need to be healthy and free from poverty. The competition closes on 17 October. You can find more information at www.thebigpicture.org.nz. 
Child Poverty Action Group has launched the first policy paper in its election year series, Our Children, Our Choices, Priorities for Policy. The first paper, Child Poverty and Health, recommends changes to current policies relating to children's health. Future documents will examine housing, early childhood education and care, compulsory education and family incomes. The International Labour Organisation ran a Tackle Child Labour Through Education initiative between 2008 and 2013. In Fiji, local journalist Margaret Wise has compiled a publication called Media Spotlight on Child Labour. The document highlights the multi-dimensional scope of child labour and the crucial role played by the media in advocacy and awareness. The European Union and the ILO are working with the Fijian government to develop policies to eradicate child labour in Fiji. The wealthiest 1% of New Zealanders now own 16% of all the wealth in the country. By contrast, the poorest 50% of New Zealanders own a total of just 5% of the wealth. Now it's time for this week's five action points. Introduce wraparound care for children starting before birth and lasting until adulthood. Make primary health care free for all children under 18, including GP visits, prescriptions, dental and optometrist care. Create a national nutrition strategy, including a food and schools program. Provide government-funded health and social services in all low decile secondary schools. Increase funding for children's health to achieve equal outcomes for Māori and Pacifica children. That's our programme for this week. Join us next week when we'll look at the impact of substandard housing on child poverty. Many children in Aotearoa live in cold, mouldy homes which are grossly overcrowded. What can we do to remedy this situation? We'll also hear from a school nurse in Mangari about the wraparound health and social services provided in her secondary school. Thanks for watching. Kakiteano.